Researchers have detected strange radio signals coming from deep space. These mysterious radio waves might just be bursts of cosmic energy from a distant neutron star. Or it could be that scientists have discovered a highly advanced civilization 90 light years away from Earth. So, what kind of civilization would have the ability to send strong signals like this? Well, scientists classify civilizations on something called the Kardashev scale. It's a scale that measures a civilization's technological ability to harness energy. While it's a hypothetical scale that could eventually have five or more levels, most scientists only refer to the first few. But don't be underwhelmed. We're the only civilization we know of. And technically, we're still stuck on type zero. At this stage, we've managed to harness some, but not all of our planet's potential energy. We consume about 18 trillion watts of power every year, and if we wanted to bump ourselves up to a Type 1 civilization, we'd need to consume over 500 times that every second. To do this, we'd need to harness, store, and utilize all of the energy available to us. That includes all raw materials and every bit of sunlight that reaches Earth. We'd also have to tame volcanoes, earthquakes, and other natural forces. At the rate at which we're developing now, it's possible that we could be a Type 1 civilization within the next 200 years. But whatever civilization scientists may have discovered in the far reaches of space could already be a Type 2 civilization or higher. Once our civilization has all of the energy available on our home planet under control and we graduate to a Type 1 on the Kardashev scale, then we need to take the next step. Time to crank up our energy consumption to 10 billion times what it was before. To do this, we'd need to harness not just all the solar energy that reaches Earth, we'd need all of the energy our star generates, period. If there is a Type 2 civilization out there, they're probably using an incredible system to do this. A Dyson Sphere. They'd build this megastructure around their star to collect all the energy it radiates out in every direction. They could even assemble other Dyson Spheres around the first Dyson Sphere to guarantee that little to no energy escapes. But. There's nothing simple about this technology, and that's why only advanced civilizations could construct something like it. For one, a Dyson Sphere must be larger than the star itself. And if these megastructures are bigger than stars, well, they should be easy to spot, right? Well, this could be tricky. Once a civilization is finished building the Dyson Sphere, the megastructure blocks nearly all of the visible light from its star. A civilization this advanced could make its own solar system invisible. Lucky for us, visible light isn't the only way to detect a star. Even with a Dyson Sphere blocking its light, a star would still radiate heat, and we could detect the star by the infrared light it gives off. But that wouldn't be the only way we might discover a civilization this advanced. Remember that strange radio signal? It originated about 90 light years away from Earth, coming from the star HD 164595. Was this powerful radio signal created by an alien race and intentionally pointed toward Earth? A civilization able to pull this off would need to be far more advanced than our own. This Type II civilization would be able to utilize the raw materials on every planet in its star system, and maybe even beyond. They may have built fusion reactors that orbit their planet, fueled with gas from other worlds with hydrogen-rich atmospheres. And they might be mining precious metals from rocky planets, just like Earth. They could terraform other planets into livable worlds for their populations, and 
they wouldn't live in fear of civilization-ending natural disasters like asteroid impacts, ice ages, or global warming because they'd have technical solutions for these, too. This alien civilization would be at the stage on the Kardashev scale where they'd be able to master interstellar travel. But if that's true, well, there should be no reason for them not to pop by for a visit, right? Well, not so fast. With all the advanced technology they might have at their disposal, these aliens could be waiting for us to catch up. That way, when our civilizations meet, we would do so as equal partners. Who knows? They could be so advanced that they're no longer a fully biological race. They could be more like cyborgs with a mix of robotic and organic material. This would make them capable of incredible things that humans could only dream of. But they wouldn't stop there. An advanced world like this would want to go farther up the Kardashev scale, and as they became a Type 3 civilization, they'd rely on something other than the power of their own star system. They would harness the power of several stars in their galaxy. With this much power, a civilization would have no problem meeting its ever-growing energy needs. They'd just hook up another star when they needed more power. If we ever advanced to this level, we'd have 100 billion stars available to harness in the Milky Way galaxy alone. A civilization like this would no doubt be the rulers of their galaxy, and they'd have the power to move entire star systems, merging them to harvest the energy they need more efficiently. So if one of these civilizations existed, well, you could detect them by observing the sudden disappearance of many stars in a faraway galaxy. This could be a sign that Dyson spheres have been constructed around not just one, but several stars. A Type 3 civilization could already be out there. After all, scientists have announced that they've found two galaxies with a highly unusual amount of infrared light. This is something we usually observe in galaxies where new stars are being born, but some unusual and sudden spikes in infrared light could mean that we've found the first signs that civilizations many times more advanced than us exist. Maybe they're about to make contact. Or maybe they already have. No one knows what to expect if we encountered other forms of alien life, would they talk like us? Look like us? Or would they be completely different? What if, instead of encountering organic alien life, we met alien artificial intelligence? What would alien technology look like? What might it be able to do? And should we be afraid of something like this? This is What If, and here's what would happen if we discovered alien AI. Humanity has dreamed up some pretty crazy technology, and we're not too far away from having our tech look like it's come out of a sci-fi movie. But it's safe to say that if aliens created technology, it would be a lot different than anything we could dream up. So. What types of alien AI could we possibly see? Nobody knows what life on other planets will be like, but the first form of alien technology we could encounter might be some sort of alien probe. To help us explain what an alien probe would be like, we're collaborating with YouTuber Isaac Arthur. Isaac hosts a YouTube channel explaining science and futurism concepts. Thanks, Peter. This probe would be tasked with finding or communicating with us. The probe would fly throughout the galaxy in an attempt to find some sort of life. It would either be wandering and searching aimlessly, or it would have some designated mission. And once that's completed, it would record any signals it found and transmit them back to the alien homeworld. The issue with this is us being able to discover it. Space is big, really, really big and the alien probe might be too far away for us to detect it. It might not want to communicate with us, and if it does, we might not know how to receive its message, 
or understand what the alien probe is trying to say to us. There might be some strange concepts too, as an alien AI might have very different motivations from anything biological, so that it might be informing us it planned to stop by and turn off into a quintillion paperclips. For an in-depth look at the kinds of motivations and psychology it might have, try out our episode, Alien AI. Back to you, Peter. Thanks, Isaac. So, if we can't communicate with the aliens and they're just simply observing us, what would happen next? Well, now that we've been discovered by alien technology, a number of things could happen. We could witness more of their technology coming to Earth. This could be in the form of a machine that could terraform our entire planet. This would be very, very bad. That's because this form of alien technology would be used to alter our Earth in whichever way its creators pleased. They might want to change Earth's atmosphere, temperature, or physical features. And in the process, the human race would most likely become extinct. No matter how many missiles and bullets we throw towards this thing, there would be virtually no way we could stop it. I mean, come on, this thing is meant to completely alter planets. You think a gun will help you fight it off? If we're lucky enough to avoid our home planet being taken over, we may get sent raw material drones. This form of AI would harvest metals and gases from us and bring them back home. Yeah, this would still suck, but we could at least have some chance of surviving this one. Okay, now we've seen the alien technology, but when do we get to meet the actual aliens? You know, the green guys with the funny heads. Well, there's two ways this could go. One is that the aliens come and they take over our planet and resources. But we have a separate story for that one called, What If Aliens Arrived Tomorrow? The second option is that we wouldn't see any aliens at all. That's because with all this incredibly advanced alien technology, there's the possibility that the aliens aren't even around anymore. Just like the way we fear AI and robots are taking over humans, that may have happened to aliens. While they were creating this advanced AI, the aliens may have given it too much power. And once that happened, their AI took over and extinguished the alien race. And then we could have the exact same thing threatening to destroy us. So as cool as it might sound, alien AI would definitely not be a cool thing for us to come up against. Attention human, you are receiving an interstellar radio transmission and it could be coming from one of the nearest exoplanets, Proxima Centauri b. What conditions make this planet a candidate for alien life? What types of civilizations could have flourished there? And should we expect them to be knocking on Earth's door any day now? This is what if, and here's what would happen if there were an alien civilization on Proxima b. At a distance of 4.2 light years away, Proxima Centauri is one of the closest stars to our Sun. In 2016, a planet was discovered orbiting in Proxima Centauri's Goldilocks zone. That's where conditions for liquid water could exist. Meet Proxima b a planet that registers at 0.87 on the Earth Similarity Index. This scale measures how similar a planet or moon is to Earth and anything above 0.8 is considered Earth-like. As another example, Mars has an ESI of 0.64. In 2020, Astronomers recorded a mysterious radio signal coming from the direction of Proxima Centauri. Could it be that an alien civilization was attempting to contact us? Though Proxima b is similar to Earth, life forms on this alien planet would likely develop very differently. For starters, the planet is about 20 times closer to its star than Earth is to the Sun. And it 
only needs 11.2 days for one full revolution. That's a lot of New Year's celebrations. But still, Proxima b receives about the same amount of solar energy as Earth. And that's because Proxima Centauri is an M-type red dwarf star. Compared to our G-type star, these stars are generally cooler in a range of 2200 to 3200 degrees Celsius. But there would be some extreme conditions that an alien civilization would have to adapt to. These extraterrestrials would need to be able to withstand radiation, and lots of it. The planet receives about 400 times more X-rays than Earth. And dwarf stars like Proxima Centauri give rise to coronal mass ejections that would blast the planet with lethal radiation. Without a protective atmosphere, this would be deadly for any potential life forms. Another challenge for a Proxima B civilization would be tidal locking. That's when a planet takes the same amount of time to spin on its axis as it does to orbit its star. Imagine living where you permanently face the scorching sun while the other side of the Earth is in a constant state of frozen darkness. This is what life would be like on this exoplanet. Civilizations on Proxima b would likely develop in the so-called Terminator Zones. These are the strips of twilight between the day side and the night side. Here, winds would carry warm air and create life-supporting conditions. And aliens would build thermal reactors with the mix of cool and hot water to have that H2O always available. But if civilizations appeared on either of the sides of the Terminator Zone, they'd need to develop different survival tactics. But collaboration and unity could allow them to supply each other with heat or ice effectively. And if a civilization developed on the light side, would they even know that there were other stars or objects in the universe? Would they even think about other life out in space? That brings us back to the radio signal the Breakthrough Listen project recorded in 2020. This signal occupied a very narrow band of the radio spectrum at 982 megahertz. This is startling because it's a portion of the spectrum rarely used by human-made transmitters. Researchers haven't ruled out the possibility that these signals originated on Earth, but there are many unanswered questions. One thing they're sure of, it didn't come from a natural world. Only manufactured or alien-made technology seems to produce signals like that. So, if an advanced civilization was trying to communicate with us from Proxima b, what would their society be like? They could be a Type 1 civilization like us and use the energy available from their planet, like oil, wind, or geothermal power. Or they could be a Type 2 civilization, using energy on the scale of their planetary system. That would mean they were thousands of years more advanced than us. Would they have developed complex languages and live in cities? Would they have democratic forms of governance? Or would they live under the rule of a dictator? You must have so many questions for our alien neighbors. And they would have so many questions for you. Or maybe they already know everything. Unfortunately, we likely won't be able to visit them anytime soon. Using current technologies, it would still take between 19,000 and 81,000 years to reach them. Of course, maybe they could travel faster than the speed of light and get here first. Thousands of light years from Earth, there could be another planet hospitable to life. Kepler 69c. And you're about to travel to this alien world to see that life with your own eyes. What would it be like to make this epic journey so far across the universe? What kind of planet would you be likely to find upon arrival? And if you did discover life, 
what would it look like? This is What If, and here's what would happen if there's life on Kepler-69c. Located 2,383 light years from Earth in the Cygnus constellation is a potential super-Earth. At least that's what it's often referred to as. Kepler-69c is an exoplanet about 1.7 times larger than our planet. And it could also be around three and a half times more massive. But there's a catch. We don't really know if this planet is located within the habitable zone of its star. If it's too close, Kepler-69c would be too hot for liquid water to exist on its surface. If it's too far from its sun, well, then it would be nothing more than a frigid world. What we do know is that Kepler-69c orbits its star about 40% closer than Earth orbits the sun. And that could mean that it isn't actually a super-Earth. It could be a super-Venus. So if you traveled all the way here, would you find life? Or a thick, scorching atmosphere boiling every drop of water on the planet? Before you begin your journey to Kepler-69c, there'd be one very important thing to keep in mind. It's far away, almost 600 times further away than Proxima Centauri, our closest neighboring star. Even if you could travel, say, 1% of the speed of light, you wouldn't get there anytime soon. At this speed, you could whip around Earth in just over 13 seconds, but to get to Kepler-69c? Well, that would take you about 238,000 years. To even make this trip possible, you'd need a super advanced hibernation pod. You know, you don't want to grow too old and die before you could even get to your destination. Am I right? Well, hibernation technology that could help you sleep for over 200,000 years doesn't exist yet, but hey, this is what if, anything's possible. By the time your ship makes its arrival, any life that may exist on Kepler-69c today could evolve or advance into something entirely different. Think about it this way. 300,000 years ago, humans were just beginning to create stone tools and spears. And look at you now, making a trip across the galaxy. Looking back at the planet you left behind, who knows what changes would happen to our human civilization during your trip. No matter what, it's way too late to turn around now. Based on the planet's distance from its star, we know that Kepler-69c receives a similar amount of sunlight as Venus. And despite being more massive than Earth, it has a relatively low density. All this means is that instead of metals, this rocky planet is made of silicate and carbonate minerals. That could make things a little complicated. You see, with all these minerals in the crust, Kepler-69c could have a really thick atmosphere. And to make matters worse, this atmosphere would be composed mostly of carbon dioxide. Uh-oh, did you choose the wrong super-Earth to travel to? Yeah, if Kepler-69c is anything like Venus, it would be a pretty hot planet. All because, similar to Venus, its clouds would trap the heat and create an extreme greenhouse effect. Kepler-69c's atmosphere would be caught in an endless cycle of getting thicker and hotter. But nobody said this world should be habitable for you. Oh no, once you took off your helmet, you'd instantly melt and suffocate. Like I said, life on this planet would be completely different from what you'd imagine. As you made your approach, you'd find surface temperatures as high as 475 degrees Celsius, and the atmospheric pressure would be over 90 times that of Earth at sea level. It would be like being 900 meters deep in the ocean, except 
you'd be on dry land. With conditions like this, you'd likely not find anything resembling an ocean here. Just like on Venus, the high temperatures would boil away all the water. Whatever life you could potentially encounter on this planet, it would need to be able to survive in these brutal conditions. Or it would have to exist somewhere else besides the surface. One place you could discover life on Kepler-69c would be up in the clouds. Around 50 kilometers up, temperatures would be much, much cooler. They would range from about 30 to 70 degrees Celsius. And with its low density, this planet could have a surface gravity that would be just over 70% of what's found on Earth. This weaker gravity could allow life forms to thrive in the sky, where Kepler-69c is most hospitable. Life could just be floating freely in the atmosphere. This would be another way in which this planet could have far more in common with Venus than with Earth. Probes around Venus have picked up traces of a gas that could be a potential sign of life, phosphine. If you discovered phosphine in Kepler-69c's atmosphere, it could be the result of bacteria that don't require oxygen to survive. But be ready to hold your nose. This smelly gas has an odor similar to decaying fish. On Earth, the bacteria that produce phosphine often live in swamps or wetlands, but on Venus or Kepler-69c, this bacteria could exist in the thick, oxygenless atmosphere itself. So, in the end, you may have traveled a very, very long way to find the smallest and stinkiest of life forms. Now, on the upside, you've just discovered extraterrestrial life. What if you found out that you had a long-lost relative? And what if that long-lost relative was from a different planet in our galaxy? And what if this faraway planet was home to billions of humans, just like Earth? But these humans don't look anything like us because they're from the future. Could aliens be future versions of humans? How far ahead of us would they be? How much would they have evolved? Would we be able to understand each other? And what would meeting future humans mean for humanity on Earth? This is What If, and here's what would happen if aliens were future humans. In 1947, a mysterious object crashed in the desert near Roswell, New Mexico. You all know this story, but could it really be aliens? The mysterious object was officially declared to be a U.S. Army Air Force balloon. But then, decades later, U.S. Navy Commander George W. Hoover, who had top secret clearance, revealed that the mysterious crash involved time-traveling humans. Somehow, these future humans had developed the technology to overcome the technological limitations that prevent us present-day humans from making the same type of trip. Some theories suggest that these future humans travel back in time in order to understand their biological past. Maybe these same time travelers helped our ancestors to make huge leaps in scientific and technological knowledge in a relatively short amount of time. But if any of these theories are true, should we be prepared for another alien human visit sometime in the near future? And what might we expect from this close encounter of the third kind? If aliens, I mean future humans, were to come and visit us again, they would probably look similar to how they appear in movies. Like us, they'd still walk on two feet, but their heads and their eyes would be much larger. 
This fits with predictions of how present-day humans will continue to evolve. We can expect our heads to be bigger and our upper skull to become more rounded to accommodate a larger brain. And as our civilization advances enough for interplanetary travel, our eyes would get bigger so we can see better in dimmer environments that are further away from the sun. Future humans might also find a way to slow the aging process. So it would be possible to make several trips to places thousands of light years away within one lifetime. If we want to travel somewhere that's 60,000 light years away, and if our technology could do it, then it would be a 60 year flight for anyone on board. But when they got back to Earth, 60,000 years would have passed. We'd like to think that humans of the future would solve this problem so they could visit Earth and come home to tell their family and friends about their trip. But if future humans find a way to live for thousands of years, would that lead to a massive overpopulation on whichever planet they inhabit? Well, chances are, if they make it possible to live that long, they will probably succeed in optimizing their existence before that. Their civilization would undoubtedly be a lot more efficient than ours. The reason being is that they could be centuries, if not millennia, ahead of us in evolutionary terms. Future humans would be a lot smarter, and they'd have better technology to maximize their space and live in densely populated worlds without producing the same high levels of pollution that we do on Earth. In fact, you could bet that future humans wouldn't just have better technology, they'd be technology. Just like some humans today have implants to perceive sound or to detect atmospheric pressure, the humans of the future would likely have dozens of technological implants to make their lives easier. Think about everything your cell phone does for you. Now, imagine you could command it with your thoughts and that it would only be a small chip in your brain. A chip or implant like that might also explain why those who claim to have encountered aliens have said that the aliens spoke to them in their native language. Could future humans simply have automatic language translators implanted in their brains? Or would humans of the future evolve past different languages? It's no secret that humans are the Earth's most dominant species. And without proof of life anywhere else in the universe, we can probably consider ourselves the most dominant species in space too. But what if there were others, just like us, millions of years ago? How do we even know that we're the first advanced civilization to call the planet Earth home? And if there have been others, what kind of traces have they left for us to find? This is what if, and here's what would happen if an advanced civilization had already existed on Earth. We know that complex life has existed on Earth for about 400 million years. But how could we look that far back? Ancient ruins and artifacts only take us back a few thousand years. Geologic records only about two million. So, if we can't rely on direct evidence, then where else could we find traces of a potentially extinct civilization? And what can we learn to make sure we avoid the same fate? Here are some numbers to make your brain hurt for a second. The universe is about 13.8 billion years old. The Earth is 4.5 billion years old. And humans have only developed our industrial civilization in the last 300 years. With all that in mind, it seems like there was ample opportunity for another advanced civilization to emerge, flourish, and die, all before we even showed up. But finding any proof of a past civilized species seems like it could be harder than even starting the civilization itself. Physical artifacts would be the most concrete evidence of past intelligent life, but it's not very likely that we'll ever find any. Over time, even our tallest buildings will crumble and our strongest materials will disintegrate. Our cities cover less than 1% of the Earth's surface, so any comparable cities from past civilizations would be easy for paleontologists to miss. Even if we knew where to look, it's unlikely that these artifacts would last any longer than a few million years. Sure, there's always fossilization, but it only provides a limited record of the past. Due to variables like when they lived and where, an industrial civilization that lasted 100,000 years, that's over 300 times longer than us, they might leave no fossil trace at all. 
So maybe we're better off looking for more indirect evidence. The best way to find that would be to look at what traces our own civilization would leave behind if it collapsed in its current state. One place we're leaving a clear trail is in the sediment at the bottom of our bodies of water. One look at this stuff and you would immediately see the wacky chemical balances that would imply some sort of outside influence. For instance, the nitrogen fertilizers that we use to grow food are running off into our bodies of water and producing low oxygen dead zones that would be visible in sedimentary layers. On top of that, we'll be leaving long-lasting synthetic molecules from radioactive fallout, steroids, and all the plastic we dump in the ocean. So yeah, future species are going to have a great impression of us. In case we're not embarrassed enough, our technological advances are rapidly changing the environment, which has brought on widespread extinctions that would be visible at fossil records. Ironically, perhaps the most promising marker of an advanced civilization could be one of the very things that brought on its downfall. When we burn fossil fuels, we are releasing carbon back into the air. Fossil fuels ultimately derive from decayed plants and animals, which contain a variety of carbon that has a different atomic mass than most carbon in our atmosphere. When this kind is released, it changes the molecular makeup of the atmosphere and leaves a clear signal to future scientists. In a 2018 study, scientists hypothesized that civilizations could even have fossil fuel driven life cycles. When fossil fuel use leads to climate change, the oxygen levels decrease in the ocean and help create a breeding ground for new fuels like oil and coal. In this way, a civilization and its demise might sow the seed for new civilizations in the future. In our search for intelligent neighbors from the past, we may never actually find any evidence, but we can learn a lot about ourselves. Analyzing our own long-term ecological footprint can have practical benefits. It helps us recognize where we can do better to achieve a balance with our planet so that we don't become the forgotten civilization of tomorrow. While it doesn't seem likely that intelligent life was here before us, that doesn't mean there wasn't any. For all we know, they were so advanced they were able to clean up their mess as they went. Do you ever feel like you're being watched? Not by a creepy stalker, but by aliens. Well, it might be happening. Just like we watch animals at the zoo, aliens may be out there watching us. Like, we're the zoo animals. <laughs> but why exactly would they be doing this in the first place? Could they be afraid of us? This is what if. And here's what would happen if we lived in a galactic zoo. Imagine being trapped in a zoo. Well, if we really do live in a galactic zoo, then you'd already be in one. Aliens could be out there watching your every move. They may want to study the human race, or learn from our technology, or maybe they're planning to attack us. But what if instead of attacking us, the aliens are afraid of us attacking them? Wait, what? If you've watched any sort of sci-fi movie, you may think of aliens as the bad guys. The ones who attack our planet and steal all our resources. Hey, shoot, get out of there. Get away, get, go. But never mind humans being afraid of aliens. They may be afraid of us. Think about it. It's entirely possible that aliens have been watching Earth since the birth of humanity. If aliens have been hanging around since the beginning, think of all the horrible destruction they've seen humans cause. Deforestation, pollution, and Let's not forget about war. Lots of war. Humans are constantly trying to kill each other. It's estimated that almost 1 billion people have died from war throughout history. So from the aliens' perspective, humans might seem like an incredibly violent, scary species. They may not want to make contact because they're afraid of how we might react, which could very well be with violence. And while aliens might be watching us, we aren't confined to a zoo. We have left the Earth and gone to the moon. But are we sure that intelligent life is even out there? Well, the odds are pretty good. The existence of alien life could be explained by the Fermi paradox. We have our sun, but in the universe there are billions of other suns. And they're billions of years older than our solar system. Orbiting these other suns could be Earth-like planets. 
And on Earth-like planets, there's a good chance of there being highly intelligent life. With so many worlds out there, there's an even better chance that at least one of them has developed interstellar travel. The Fermi Paradox suggests that with interstellar travel, it would take a few million years to travel through the entire Milky Way galaxy. You may think that sounds like an incredibly long time, but if there's a civilization that is billions of years older than us, it would just be a tiny fraction of their history. So, if all this is true, which is very likely, the aliens may have already found us. And apart from us being a pretty violent species, we may not be interesting enough for them to make contact with us. We may just be another life form out of the thousands or millions that the aliens have seen. After all, if you see an ant colony on the ground, do you try to make contact with it? You most likely go along with your day. To other life forms out there, we may just be a simple group of ants. Ants they don't want to hurt or bother. Just observe. Another thing we have to keep in mind is how we communicate with the aliens. Ants in our world might be trying to communicate with us, but unless they send the right signals, we'll never know. The same goes for the aliens and us. We may not be communicating with the aliens the right way. They may not even know that we want to make contact with them, so they just leave us alone. Aliens? Enchiladas? What is this world coming to? Or should I say, what is coming to this world? This is what if, and here's what would happen if we found alien life on Enceladus. First of all, it's pronounced Enceladus, not Enchiladas. Sorry, muchacho. Enceladus is Saturn's sixth largest moon but it would be better described as a winter wonderland. Winter because it's covered in ice and has an average surface temperature of minus 200 degrees. Wonder because just 40 kilometers below its surface are the ingredients for life. Are there aliens out there? How long until we know for sure? This is the Waimangu geyser. It doesn't exist anymore, but when it did, it could shoot water 460 meters high, making it the largest geyser ever known on Earth. But beyond our atmosphere, Waimangu is a drop in the bucket. If you want to see a real geyser, you should book a trip to Saturn. In September 2005, NASA's billion-dollar Cassini space probe was approaching Saturn when it detected huge eruptions at the southern pole of Enceladus. This tiny moon is roughly 25 times smaller than Earth, but its geysers are 8,000 times bigger than anything recorded on our planet. Cassini recorded bursts that went as far as 240 kilometers into space, which is about the distance from Washington, D.C. to Philadelphia. But if these bright plumes of mysterious vapor were a sight to behold, scientists were more in awe of what remained hidden Beneath 40 kilometers of thick ice, there's an ocean on Enceladus, and it's remarkably similar to the oceans we have on Earth, where life might have begun. The data collected by the Cassini space probe indicates that the water on Enceladus is salty and is likely heated by hydrothermal vents. If Enceladus's ocean works like our own, it's expected that these subsurface vents expel hydrogen-rich hot water which mixes with organic compounds to create amino acids, which combine to form proteins, the ingredients for life. Our planet is estimated to be about four and a half billion years old. The earliest evidence for life on Earth comes from fossils that were found in rocks that were roughly 3.7 billion years old. Today, Enceladus is estimated to be about one billion years old, which if it's following the Earth-like timeline, would put it at the right age to start supporting life. But considering that for 90% of our planet's history, life on Earth was microbial, chances are that alien life on Enceladus would also be microbial. The big question is, what might these aliens look like? We're talking about creatures formed in cold, dark water with no access to sunlight. How would they interact with their environment? Would they glow in the dark? 
or would they see without eyes? How might they evolve in size and in intelligence? And will we ever find them? Or will they find us? Something is emerging from the Mariana Trench and it does not belong on this planet. If aliens lived in the deepest place in the ocean, what would they look like? How would they communicate with one another? And what would happen if we dared to contact them? This is What If, and here's what would happen if there were aliens at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. There's a reason why the idea of aliens living at the bottom of the sea keeps popping up in popular culture. Many of us are far more afraid of what lies down there than whatever's looking down at us from up in space. After all, 80% of the ocean is still unmapped and unexplored. We have better maps of the Moon, Mars, and Venus than we do of our sea floor. The most mysterious part of our oceans is the Mariana Trench. Its deepest point, the Challenger Deep, stretches 11 kilometers down. The Mariana Trench is anything but a great vacation spot. No light is able to reach its bottom, and temperatures are just a few degrees above freezing. Not to mention its crushingly high water pressure. So how could aliens survive the deepest spot in the ocean? The water pressure at the bottom of the Mariana Trench is over 1,000 times the atmospheric pressure that you're used to at sea level. This kind of pressure would crush anything even the toughest deep-sea robots we've ever built. But some living things managed to adapt and thrive under such pressing conditions, like translucent snailfish and sea cucumbers. The hydal snailfish, known as the deepest living fish, flourishes at depths of over eight kilometers. Unlike you, deep sea fish don't have pockets to store air in their bodies. That oxygen inside your lungs is what gives you the feeling of pressure whenever you take a dive. No air means this fish has a higher tolerance to the weight of all that water above it. Whatever aliens were lurking down below would share the same characteristic. Storing air just wouldn't be their thing. But what would they do for food? Well, it's likely they'd imitate their seafloor neighbors once again. Deep sea creatures gorge on the decaying remains of microbes, algae, or animals from above. Our sunken ships might be their version of a surprise buffet. Any extraterrestrial life down at the pit of the trench would probably eat similar food. They'd burrow into the biggest carcasses they could find and consume what's left from the inside out, like a giant hagfish does. Or they might possess enormous mouths and expandable stomachs, allowing them to catch and digest large quantities of food as they move. And those big mouths of theirs would also be filled with long fangs pointed inward this would enable them to catch and hold on to other deep sea creatures or, you know, any other prey that just so happens to dive a little too far from the surface. Hey, don't judge them. In a habitat as precarious as the Mariana Trench, aliens would need to capitalize on any and all sources of nutrition. They'd also have to go the extra mile in order to let one another know that they're out there in the pitch dark. That's because sunlight can only travel up to one kilometer into the ocean. Anywhere deeper than that, and you wouldn't be able to see a thing. So how would our underwater aliens put the notice out that they're around? Well, two ideas, by sound and by light they produce themselves. Like fireflies, 
deep sea creatures are able to produce and emit their own light thanks to a process called bioluminescence. With it, aliens would be able to connect with each other through specific lighting patterns. For long-distance communication, they could send out sound waves across enormous distances in the water, like the humpback whale, who's able to sing in the Caribbean and be heard off the west coast of Ireland, 6,400 kilometers away. Now, what would first contact with this underwater species look like for us? Well, we'd have to get there first. We'd need a vessel strong enough to withstand the constantly intensifying pressure. The tiniest of cracks would squash you and your submarine faster than you can say human jam. Once down there, we'd have to take into account that living at the bottom of the sea would be like living on another planet. If aliens existed in the otherworldly depths of the Mariana Trench this entire time, they may not want to be friendly neighbors. And the darkness alone would make it difficult to locate and study our subjects. Before approaching these extraterrestrials, we'd have to assess their communication style first, slowly and patiently. We'd need to understand how they interact with their environment, too. That is, assuming they don't feel threatened by our presence and decide to do something about it. Trust goes both ways when you're trying not to be crushed or eaten in the name of science. Scientists have pieced together a pretty clear picture of what life was like on Earth thousands, even millions of years ago. But if you fast forward one million years from now, would alien civilization be doing the same to learn about us? What would Earth look like one million years from now? What remains of human civilization would still be around? And would we end up clones in a human version of Jurassic Park? This is What If, and here's what would happen if aliens came to Earth a million years in the future. We're living in the Anthropocene epoch, and in this historical period, the human impact on the world around us has been significant enough to geologically alter it. 100 years from now, it could be an era defined by ecological collapse and mass extinction. Big bummer, right? Now, there's no way for us to know how or when our species may take its final walk on our home planet. A team of alien scientists could find evidence of nuclear fallout, climate change, or maybe a massive asteroid that ended our existence. Or maybe they'd even find us already living on another planet. Maybe one million years from now, you'd be an alien on board a starship that has just entered into orbit around Earth. I can't tell if you're joking or not. But despite your best efforts to scan the planet below for intelligent life, you'd find nothing. Your trip down to the surface would be slightly delayed by an ongoing supervolcanic eruption. The planet would be blanketed in the darkness of ash. You might even have to wait a few years for your alien crew to clean it up before you could even land. Finally, you'd get approval to visit Earth. Down there, you'd find everything to be barren and lifeless. Storms, fires and earthquakes would have erased nearly all signs of immediately visible life. But your team of archaeologists and paleontologists would know that if they wanted to find evidence of past civilizations, they better start digging. You'd be investigating what are called boundary layers. These are geological signatures that indicate a transition from one period to the next. So you'd be looking for animal and plant fossils, as well as changes in rock layers. You could find a thin layer of clay that marks the boundary to our Anthropocenic era. 
The top layer would contain not much more than small fossilized remains of a few plant species. The layer below would contain older rock, but not only that, there would be an abundance of diverse plant fossils. This would be a breakthrough for your team as they'd now confirm there was some form of mass extinction period. As you searched through this layer, the nature of what happened to Earth over the past million years would be revealed. You'd discover an unnatural amount of carbon deposits from fossil fuel emissions, evidence of global temperature changes and widespread chemical pollutants. But the effects of climate change may have reversed themselves over the one million years humans have been absent. If your team were to uncover the regions where our coastal populations used to be, you could excavate the remains of cities relatively well preserved in the sedimentary rock. Imagine discovering the ancient subway tunnels and sewers of New York. But nothing you would find would be in pristine condition. Bricks would have gone from their characteristic red to gray, and steel would have rusted and dissolved, leaving only imprints in the soil. Finally, you'd make the biggest discovery of all fossilized human bones. Just like the dinosaurs, these too would most likely only be found encased in sedimentary rock. Almost all of the fossils of dinosaurs that we discover today are from species that would have lived near lakes or rivers that flooded. Floods covered their remains in mud and silt very quickly, and this prevented their bones from rotting. The same would apply to Homo sapiens. Your alien team would piece together the puzzle that many of these human fossils were the result of catastrophic floods or tsunamis. And based on how much these bones have fused with the rocks around them, your team could start to assemble a timeline of our unfortunate demise. Usually, bones take decades to decompose. If buried in a dry environment like a funeral casket, they could last for 100 years. Mummified bones can survive thousands of years. Finding any of these would tell your team that the last humans to walk the Earth weren't all that far in the past. But discovering only fossilized remains would reveal our extinction point being further back than you'd hoped. There wouldn't be any samples of soft tissues like muscles, just rocks that used to be bones. Oh, but you'd probably find fossilized plastic in the layers of sedimentary rock too. It's not yet known how long plastic waste needs to decompose into organic matter. It could take hundreds of years, maybe thousands. Or, as you and your crew could discover, millions. What you'd keep your hopes up for would be the real holy grail, human DNA. The oldest DNA samples found in our modern times date back 800,000 years and come from insects and plants. But studies conclude that DNA could take about 7 million years to disintegrate. And Eureka! You'd find human DNA samples trapped in ice cores in what was once Greenland. Now, the big question would be, what do you do with them? Study human genetics for scientific purposes or have a little fun? One idea would be to clone these ancient humans. You could even create some kind of Jurassic Park filled with people, except it would be called Anthropocene Park. And based on all that you'd put together about our tragic history, there would be so many entertaining things to do in this amusement park. Maybe you could clone other animals and play a game of mass extinction. The winner would be the one who could kill the most species in the shortest amount of time. You could dig for hidden oil reserves, increase carbon emissions for fun to watch icebergs melt, or how about a game of nuclear war? Sadly though, you and the other scientists probably wouldn't be able to figure out what life was like for humans at the end of our civilization. It's the oldest question on Earth. Where did we come from? 
Some people may thank a creator from above, but what if the hand that created humanity wasn't divine? What if aliens brought life to Earth? How could a meteor carry life to our planet? Could microbes survive the cold vacuum of space? And does alien life already exist on Earth? This is What If, and here's what would happen if aliens brought life to Earth. When you think of aliens, your imagination might run wild with movie scenes and X-Files reruns, but technically, an alien includes anything not from Earth. And that broad definition opens up some intriguing possibilities. In 2017, Astronomers detected a mysterious chunk from an exoplanet that entered our solar system. Called Oumuamua, this interstellar object is made from nitrogen ice, the perfect radiation shield for an organism that might be hitching a ride. After all, if this pancake-shaped rock can keep its ice formation while flying through the galaxy, then Maybe life can not only exist beyond the solar system, but also travel frozen in space. But if an object like this slammed into Earth, would the organisms survive the impact? When our solar system was still forming, the chunk of rock that would become Earth floated around completely unprotected from meteors and asteroids. If an object like Oumuamua had landed on Earth during that time, it could have brought microbes and other organisms from deep space. This is called the panspermia theory, which states that matter from surrounding planets or objects from deep space might have brought life to Earth. But how could we test this theory? Researchers aboard the International Space Station found that bacteria survived on the panels outside the station. Even the extreme temperatures of space didn't kill the bacteria. Well, what does that prove? Well, if a spacecraft left from Mars with microbial life attached, those microbes could survive the trip to Earth. But let's go back to the early days of our planet. Almost four billion years ago, Earth went through a bombardment period. During this time, powerful meteor showers regularly rocked the surface of our world, and several objects the size of Oumuamua, about 800 meters long, crashed into the Earth. So if there were microbes deep within those meteors, they might have been cushioned from the impact. And that's pretty impressive, considering meteors travel at speeds of up to 100 kilometers per second. And during that chaotic time, life began springing up all over Earth. After all, bacteria can thrive in temperatures as high as 113 degrees or be preserved at minus 196 degrees. So if those meteors had contained microbial life, it would have survived the impact and possibly planted the seeds of life. But how could we know if alien life is already here? Well, that evidence is harder to find. We still haven't found life anywhere other than Earth, so thinking that life could have come from somewhere else might be a bit of a stretch. But in a system 400 light years away, we have found the elements of life. Using radio telescope technology, Danish researchers found glycolaldehyde, a simple sugar needed to produce ribonucleic acid, or RNA. This is the macromolecule responsible for making proteins and coding genes. Glycolaldehyde is floating out there in space, waiting for a carrier to bring it to a world like ours. But maybe it's already here. Amino acids and sugars, the building blocks of life, come in two versions that mirror each other. We call this phenomenon chirality, and 
we refer to the versions as left and right. But on Earth, all life contains left-handed shaped amino acids and right-handed shaped sugars. And that's unusual, as scientists creating amino acids in a lab would make half of them left-handed and half right-handed. So single shapes in amino acids and sugars could be an evolutionary function, or they could be an extraterrestrial influence. You know, whether life came to Earth from outside our solar system in a rock, or on the bottom of an alien's foot, it's hard to ignore this theory when we think about our place in the universe. But what if our planet has spread life in the same way? What if ancient life escaped Earth? Well, that's a story for another What If. Researchers have detected strange radio signals coming